Hello, I'm Katie and this is Art Snaps, the podcast which celebrates Swindon Museum and Art Gallery's collection of modern British art. Whilst we're unable to visit the collection during lockdown, I've been looking at a selection of artworks every week so that we can keep feeling inspired and entertained by Swindon's collection, from the comfort of our own homes. Last week we looked at ceramics due to go on show in our postponed exhibition, A Celebration of Colour, and this week we're going to focus on another exhibition, which opened before lockdown. Pop and Prosperity highlights artworks from Swindon's collection which reflect a new era of possibility in post-war Britain, with a particular focus on the 1960s. Back in episode two, I spoke about three abstract paintings from the exhibition by Richard Smith, William Gear, and Terry Frost. And we looked at these in relation to this great new moment of self-expression in British art. And today I'm going to tell you about three very different artworks on show in Pop and Prosperity, which explore three very different ways of working in the 1960s. We're going to start by taking a look at pop art, which actually began in the 1950s, but is often closely associated with the excitement and optimism of the 60s. And this is because it embraced the fantasies offered by the media and advertising, and the glamour and pleasure which coincided with the economic resurgence of the 1960s. Richard Hamilton was one of the key artists to emerge in the first wave of British pop art, and his work reflected his interest in two innovations of the era, modern technology and mass media culture. And his iconic 1956 collage, named Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing, humorously sums up the optimism of the time. Swindon's piece, Interior Study A, from 1964, was created in a similar fashion, with images taken from several contemporary sources, carefully cut out and put together to construct an imaginary interior space. These sources reflect an interest in easily accessible consumables, as well as his effort to break down the hierarchies of high and low imagery. In other words, the division between fine art and the kind of images that we see every day. The glamorous young woman has been cut out of an advertisement where she was originally admiring a washing machine. And the setting is the house of the daughter of the famous realist artist Edouard Manet, which was photographed for a magazine. And it originally contained an easel, which Hamilton has replaced with a television set. The woman, in her new setting, seems to react to the image on the screen. But the space is fractured, with bits added on and blocked out. A strip to the left has extended the space, and a big desk or table is in the foreground. And in adding this, Hamilton was acknowledging the observer. He's understanding that if you put something close to the viewer, you make them part of it, and establish a relationship between them and the constructed space. And this is important in this piece because it's one of a group of collages, paintings and screen prints made in 1964 and 65, which arose from Hamilton's fascination with perception. Of the collages, he wrote that they attempt to, quote, explore how wild the perspective relationships could be and yet still be legible as a space. I discovered that there were practically no limits that you could produce any number of wall-like faces in relationship to one another, and it would somehow provide a natural kind of space. So long as there was some kind of furnishing in it, some kind of human being to give it scale. Unquote. So we can see that he's not only looking at images of the time and the way they're bound up with consumerism, media and technology, but also how we, as the viewer, perceive them. And I think that's perhaps what makes much of Hamilton's work so enduring and interesting. Another artistic development which emerged in the 1960s was conceptualism. And this refers to art which is led by ideas and information, rather than formal or aesthetic concerns. And this is partly what makes conceptualism so daunting to many of us. On the surface, it's unsatisfying to look at, and we quite often have to work a bit harder to understand what it's trying to tell us. Michael Craig Martin's puzzling piece, The Box That Never Closes, from 1967, is no exception, and as far as pieces in Swindon's collections go, it's a bit divisive. 
So I wanted to take this opportunity to look at Michael Craig Martin and think a bit more about the ideas behind the box. Though born in Dublin, Craig Martin grew up in America and studied at Yale University from 1961 to 66, against the backdrop of a New York art scene which was dominated by minimalism on the one hand and pop art on the other. Though I would argue that these movements feed into the bold, colourful still lives for which Craig Martin is now so well known, it's ultimately conceptualism which is at the heart of his practice. In 1966 he moved to England and taught at the Bath Academy of Art in Corsham, and for the next three years boxes formed the basis of his work. He chose the box format because of its utilitarian and familiar nature, which was at the same time, in his own words, highly receptive to the introduction of discrete ideas. The box that never closes has the smooth white finish of a domestic appliance, but though it emulates functionality, it doesn't have a purpose. Even its basic use as a box is denied because it cannot be fully closed. Its shape implies that it should, that the lid can be pushed down and it will be whole. But, of course, it's in our nature, with our understanding of the form and purpose of a cube box, to complete the process of closing the box in our mind. Even as we understand that it's a museum exhibit and not an actual box. Craig Martin is another artist interested in perception. He's exploring the way we look, the way we experience, through a push and pull between actual and imagined looking. The idea is that we become very aware of our own perception as a viewer in an art gallery. It goes without saying that this puzzling approach to art isn't for everybody, but it certainly leaves us with food for thought. Finally, I want to look at this piece by Tom Phillips from 1968. Its full title is Here we exemplify the preservative, additive and subtractive modes, thesis as object and artwork as residue of process. A bit of a mouthful, isn't it? And it's a piece which I've always been intrigued by, but never quite got to grips with. So I thought I'd take a closer look at Philip's work and find out what he's trying to do with these overlapping and obscured words. I think a good way to begin to understand him is to look at his early studies, particularly as this is a reasonably early work by Phillips. From 1957 to 60, he studied literature at St Catherine's College in Oxford, and whilst he was there he spent time acting, making music, working on film and theatrical projects, and attending drawing classes at the Ruskin School of Arts. He then went to the Camberwell School of Art from 1961 to 63. And this diverse range of activity really feeds into his work, which is incredibly rich, eclectic and versatile. As a result, you can't really pin him into a specific group or movement in art. His career is resistant to categorisation, which is at once frustrating and refreshing, and perhaps explains why I couldn't find reference to him in any of my usual British art history reference books, despite his CBE for services to the arts. But one thing that's evident when looking at his career is a great cross-pollination of art forms, with music, literature and visual art often sharing one space. We also see an interest in the relationship between language and visual imagery, and words are very much at the heart of his practice. Swindon's painting, which is better known by its shortened title, Play, Here We Exemplify, is one of a series of three, and the others are owned by the Tate Gallery and the Peter Moores Foundation. He created it by drawing out the long title on the canvas horizontally several times, using four-inch stencils, until the canvas was completely covered. And he later explained that the repeated stenciling was the equivalent to a musical canon, and the colour of each crossing point in the design is a careful blend of the underlaying and overlaying colour. So it reflects his great interest in the relationship between music and visual art. And by doing this, he also creates what he referred to as a parody of academic formality, which is demonstrated in the way that the letters cancel each other out and become incomprehensible. 
An interest in art and language was very much something which emerged with conceptualism in the 1960s, and it's likely that Phillips was taking that in. But I think what he's created here is much more playful and visually stimulating than much conceptual art. It draws you in and makes you keep looking, as well as presenting an intellectual stimulus. So that's our three artworks for this week, and I'd like to round off by mentioning a few extra things. The first is that if you want to see more of the Pop and Prosperity exhibition, you can search for Swindon Museum and Art Gallery on Arch UK, because through their exciting new curation tool, the museum has been able to reconstruct a large amount of the exhibition. So you can take a look at more of the artworks from Pop and Prosperity from the comfort and safety of your own home. Secondly, if you've enjoyed this podcast and you have or know anyone with a family at home, take a look at our brand new Art Burst on Pop Art, which offers exciting activities for youngsters and it's available for free through our Art on Tour blog www.swindermuseumandartgallery.org.uk slash art on tour. Finally, whether you're a regular or a new listener, I want to thank you for supporting Swindon Museum and Art Gallery and the Art on Tour project by listening to these art snaps. Back in episode one, I said that we'd be making 10 episodes during lockdown, which should make this our last one. But as we're still in lockdown and uncertain about how long Swindon Museum and Art Gallery will be closed for, I'm going to keep these going indefinitely to make sure you're getting your weekly dose of art appreciation. So look out for next week's episode, which will focus on another great exhibition we're missing out on, which showcases several pieces by Swindon Railway artist Hubert Cook, which are on loan to Steam Museum as part of the Art on Tour project. Until then, stay safe and well. Bye for now!